Hello and welcome back to Metal Machine Shop. Today I'm going to be looking at the tilting mechanisms for a tilting velomobile or three-wheeled motorbike. I've been working on a velomobile design to see if I can get to a workable solution. A velomobile is a human-powered enclosed bicycle and what I want is a recumbent, streamlined, tilting three-wheeler. Here's my basic design. It's a reverse trike with two steering wheels at the front and a single driven wheel at the back. The front wheels steer. The designs in this video would also apply to a trike with the two wheels at the back like this sketch. The main advantage of a streamlined velomobile is much lower aerodynamic drag than an upright bicycle, allowing a higher speed for a given power input. Here are the power speed curves for a normal upright bike, the pink curve, compared with a streamlined velomobile, the blue curve. With a rider on an upright bike working at a reasonably energetic 100 watts, the bike will achieve about 18 miles an hour on the flat. A streamlined recumbent will be going well over 25 miles an hour at 100 watts. A two-wheeled velomobile could tilt like a normal bicycle, but you need to stop it falling over when you stop. This needs holes to stick your feet through or some sort of outrigger, neither of which are great options. A rigid three-wheeler solves this problem, but as it can't lean into bends, it needs to be wider to stop it tipping over. A tilting three-wheeler with a tilt-lock mechanism will get around these issues, but it's hard to achieve an elegant design solution. We can look to three-wheeled motor scooters for inspiration. I've also seen tilting three-wheeled motorbikes and even quad bikes on the internet, but some of these seem to miss the point to me, as they are just as wide as the originals. If you can lean into the curve, you don't need that extra width for stability. So, let's look at design considerations for a tilting velomobile. First, I want my velomobile to tilt like a normal bike as if it were a two-wheeler. This model is a cross-section of my velomobile at the front wheel. You can see the back wheel and this is where the front wheel would be if it was a two-wheeler. The body is about 400mm wide at this point and it pivots around the point where the tyre touches the ground like a normal bike. On my model I've shown the lean angle in degrees. The maximum bicycle lean angle that you can get is about 35 degrees. The skinny tyres are going to let go much above this point, so if I can achieve a workable design solution with a 35 degree lean angle, then I'll be happy. Tilting scooters can lean up to about 45 degrees, but that's a bit beyond my bravery limits, to be honest. Aerodynamics are paramount in our design, as this is the reason for the existence of the Velomobile, and I really don't want to make too many compromises here. Three-wheeled scooters are not very aerodynamic. On the Velomobile, I don't want the tilting mechanism to disrupt the smooth shape of the body, and it's got to be as streamlined as possible. Also, I want the tilting mechanism to be outside the body, freeing up space inside the rider if possible. I'll be looking out for tyre scrub, which is where the tyre is dragged sideways across the ground, leaning to more tyre wear and greater rolling resistance. I need to maintain clearance between the wheels and struts and the velomobile body, not forgetting that the wheels also need to steer. I need to think about ground clearance and the velomobile needs to be as narrow as possible. Simplicity and lightweight are also key. I don't want too many parts or excess weight to drag around. Finally, suspension. I'm after about 50mm of suspension travel for a smooth ride. At the high speeds I'm expecting, it's going to get bumpy without it. So now let's take a look at the options for the tilting geometry. The ideal design from a geometric perspective looks like this. It has two rigid parallel arms of equal length and has the tyres directly below the outer pivots. The arms can be any distance apart, any length and positioned high or low without affecting the tilting function. Unfortunately, in practice, the arms have to be positioned well above the wheels to maintain the geometric purity of this design. We could use a heavily dished wheel instead, but these would need to be custom made for the Velomobile. Here's a model of this design. As it tilts, there's no wheel scrub, the arms remain parallel to the ground and the wheels remain parallel to the body centreline. Although this design works for a scooter, which is relatively tall, it constrains the wheel diameter and increases the height and frontal area of our machine. Worse, the arms would need to be well spaced or massive for rigidity, putting them in the rider's line of sight so it's only really an option for the tricycle configuration with the two wheels behind the rider. In fact, it could be a pretty good option for a trike. So I'm going to be looking at the geometry that best compares to this ideal design but gets past its limitations. The first option looks like this. It, rain it retains the two parallel arms pivoted on the centreline, but moves the outer pivots inwards to clear the wheels. 
The pivots must be close to the wheels to maintain the ideal geometry as far as possible. I've added some suspension with a single shock and the two arms are jointed in the middle. With the suspension at the rest position, the arms are in line with each other. So let's see how this setup behaves. The upper arm's middle section is inside the body and cutouts in the body will be needed. The lower arm can be outside the body and will need to be mounted lower than my model and possibly with some recesses in the body for clearance. The shock is a standard mountain bike shock drawn to scale. At 35 degrees of lean angle, the two arms are no longer parallel to the ground. This is because the outer pivots are inboard of the wheels, creating a triangle which raises the inner pivot and lowers the outer under lean. This effect is reduced by moving the pivots closer to the wheel centreline. These triangles make the angle between the arms and the body centreline greater than the lean angle, which worsens clearance between the arms and the body. At 35 degrees there's a reasonable clearance between the inner wheel and the body, but at 45 degrees it's gone, so longer arms and a wider track would be needed. The shock has burst through the side of the body and it might have to go on the upper arms instead. There's not much tyre scrub though, just about 2cm, so nothing to worry about there. Suspension compression makes our problems worse. My model shows what happens with 50mm of suspension travel. Everything is fine when upright and there is hardly any tyre scrub. At 35 degrees lean, the clearance problems with the inner wheels are compounded. The next setup is a slight variation with the top arm now separated into two slightly shorter arms with the pivots about 30mm apart. The bottom arm is unchanged. This will pull the top of the wheels in very slightly under suspension compression, eliminating the wheel scrub in the upright position. The length of the arms will have to be fine-tuned to get this effect spot on. If they are too short, the tyres will scrub outwards rather than inwards. As this approximates to the previous version, the performance under tilt is similar. At 35 degrees, the top arms are not quite parallel with the bottom, meaning the wheels are angled inwards slightly relative to the body. Tire scrub is minimal at about zero on the inner wheel and one centimetre on the outer wheel. At 45 degrees the effect is exaggerated, but this is still probably a workable design given longer arms for clearance. Suspension works well upright, but again we'll have clearance problems at high lean angles. On the next variant we're going to separate the bottom arms as well as the top, giving two parallelograms. The suspension is retained, but now we have the pivots arranged in a trapezium shape which might lead to some odd things when tilted. Let's see. Yep, as I thought, at 35 degrees there are lots of odd things going on. The arms are angled downwards which is raising the body relative to the ground. There's more scrub on the outer wheel than before but none on the inner wheel. And this is because of that strange suspension geometry. If the shock was replaced by a rigid link and equal in length to the lower pivot separation, the arms would remain straight and wouldn't angle down. At 45 degrees the outer tyre scrub is more severe but the inner is ok. A positive effect on the arms angling down is a slight improvement in the body clearance with the inner wheel, but clearance is still a problem. With suspension compression we get a little scrub when upright and increasing clearance problems at lean angles. The next variant is similar to the one we've just looked at but with a much greater separation of the arms inner pivots. Moving the lower arms inner pivots outwards is going to help reduce clearance issues. In this case, the body spacing is set to match the shock length at the rest position, giving a parallelogram arrangement of the suspension pivots, and hopefully avoiding the problems we saw on the previous design. Let's have a look and see what happens. Well, that's not good. At 35 degrees, the arms remain parallel with each other, so there is no rise or fall of the body, but the arms are angled significantly against the ground and there is an extreme angle between the body centreline and the arms. Both of the wheels have been pulled in a lot, giving a lot of tyre scrub and reducing the body clearance of the inner wheel. Lean angles much greater than 35 degrees are basically unachievable. With suspension travel it's ok upright, but completely unworkable at significant lean angles. So let's now look at some variants in the suspension arrangements. This design is the same as design 4, but now with two shocks connected at their inner ends to a short lever which pivots around the lower arm's pivot. This geometry behaves the same as design 4 at all lean angles and under suspension compression. There is no body rise or fall and the tyre scrub is minimal. It's slightly heavier and more complex though and those shocks are outside the body where they are going to cause extra drag. It's not a bad design though. This next design is a variant of design 5 and also has two shocks, this time connected to a pivoting T-piece. 
We immediately start to get problems under lean with about two or three centimetres of body rise at 35 degrees. There's also quite a lot of tyre scrub and this all gets a lot worse at 45 degrees. Finally, let's try the same design but with the inner end of the shocks connected to the same axis. In practice the shocks will have to be offset a little to achieve this. At 35 degrees of tilt we still have the body rise and at 45 it's even worse with lots of tyre scrub. Suspension compression actually helps as it offsets the body rise and the scrub to some extent but this is not an ideal situation. So what have we learned from all this? I think the key thing is the need to keep as close as possible to what I called the ideal geometry at the start. This is the closest we can get to the tilting characteristics of a two-wheeled bicycle. It eliminates body rise and tyre scrub and is the simplest design. If we don't put the arms directly above the wheels, as in design 3, the outer pivots are going to be inboard of the wheel centre lines, but we need to keep them as close to the wheels as possible, and dished wheels would help here. I didn't find a practical design that keeps the arms outside the body. The closest we got to design 6, but this didn't work at all in practice, unfortunately. Basically, we must accept that either we have the arms way above or below the body, or we'll need slots or an opening in the body. There was nothing to be gained by separating the inner pivot. The pivots need to be as close together, and more pivots will add weight. It does allow the left and right arms to be symmetrical, and as the pivots don't need to be offset to overlap. It also makes the required suspension geometry more complex. The Velomobile should be as narrow as possible, and 800mm is the target maximum for my design, but I now think this is about the practical minimum too. The need for clearance between the wheels, arms and body drives the width. Now, here's the rub. A standard Velomobile like the Quest is 800mm wide, and I can't get my tilting version any less than this without having an open mechanism or tiny wheels. I reckon I could if I went for a trike configuration, but that does bring other design challenges around having a differential and getting the drive to the two rear wheels. So is it worth it? Well that really depends on how much you want your design to tilt, and uh, it's up to you to decide I guess. I think it's worth it. The suspension caused a lot of problems with body clearance being the main issue. With my designs, 3 to 4 centimetres of suspension travel is about the practical maximum, but this would still be worth having I think. It, I would probably ditch the shock and go for a more compact rubber pad, a bit like a Brompton. The suspension pivot geometry also caused all sorts of problems and needs to be reconsidered. The T-piece was a failure on design 8. The single arm worked well on design 7, but again was a failure on design 9. With separated arm pivots, as in design 8, the parallelogram arrangement of levers will be needed instead of the T-piece to keep the arms parallel when tilting. I don't like this for a Velomobile as it's complex and adds a lot of weight, but for a motorbike it may be a reasonable option. By the way, remember that none of these designs are self-supporting and will topple over at rest without a tilt lock. So, here's my design solution resulting from all this. I'm pushing the tilting mechanism as far forwards as possible where the body is narrowest, and I'm using single central pivots. The arms will be swept back to get the wheels in the right place. I'm making the top arms carry the weight of the Velomobile as they will have to be partially inside the body where the thickness won't cause extra drag. I've chosen a rubber pad for suspension rather than the shock, but if I included a shock it could be fully internal. The external bottom arms take mainly tensile or compressive loads, so it can be very slender. The body is circular in section where the top arms pass through it, so the fared, exposed portion can be flushed with the body throughout its travel. I will have to cut slots in the body for the arms to pass through, and I'll think about how these can be sealed or covered in some way to reduce the drag. The lower arms are pushed down as far as I can go to avoid body and ground clearance problems. The outer pivots are as close to the wheel centreline as I can get them, and the wheels are offset slightly to bring the centreline closer still. I'll integrate steering pushrods into the thicker top arm where they won't cause any extra drag. Finally, there's a tilt lock mechanism based on a cut down brake disc and caliper. So that's it. I hope that made sense. Please leave any comments in the section down below and let me know whether you think I got this right or wrong. Don't forget to like the video if indeed you did like it and subscribe to the channel if you want to see more information a bit like this. Thank you for watching and see you next time.